Good morning to you. Let's continue with our study of the Word of God as we find it summed up and expressed in our Confession of Faith, uh, the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith, published in 1677. Yes, we did it. And we are still in chapter 2 and still in paragraph 1. Last week we reviewed everything from last semester as we're taking our time to go a little bit more slowly through this chapter because it's very important truths um, and things that we often don't get to focus on during sermons as much. So it's a a good opportunity and a good place to to do so. Uh, This morning we come to the phrase in our confession, chapter 2, paragraph 1, where it says, who alone, speaking of God, of course, who alone hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. If you look at the Westminster Confession of Faith, which our confession is largely drawn from, you won't find this. Uh, Where does this come from? This comes from, first off, it's just an actual quotation from the Scriptures. It's from 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, and it was used in the particular Baptist's first Confession of Faith. We often speak of the Second London Baptist Confession of Faith. The First London Baptist Confession of Faith included this quotation, sort of a a summary quotation from 1 Timothy 6.16. They lifted that and brought it into their version, uh, their edition, their editing of the Westminster Confession and the Savoy Declaration. So why did the particular Baptists include this phrase, who alone hath immortality dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto, and what does it mean? Well, we find basically two things confessed here, and the first, which we'll talk about, and then we'll move to the second one, is divine immortality. Divine immortality. The the easy answer to why did they include this in their confession is because it's in the Word of God, but they could have quoted the whole Word of God, but they're quoting this because it, it confesses and expresses divine immortality. God, who alone hath immortality. And then the second part of it, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, is really a, a repetition of God's incomprehensibility, and we'll come to that later. So consider with me in the first place divine immortality, drawn from 1 Timothy 6, 16, which says these very words, who alone has immortality. That may seem like a strange thing to say. Speaking of God, God alone has immortality. I thought that the soul is immortal, and I thought that the life that we have in Christ is an eternal life, an an immortal life. So how is it that God alone has immortality? Well, let's consider what it means to be mortal and what mortality is and then better understand why God alone has it and we have it in a different way. So for man, mortality, or we're looking right now at mortality, is the power to divide the soul and body. Something is mortal, well, men are mortal, because the soul and the body can be separated. That's what it means to die. When the soul leaves the body, it is death. That is the moment of death. Uh, And until the soul leaves the body, you are not dead. And so our mortality, our being mortal, is that we are susceptible to this. Our souls can be divided from our bodies. So for men... This is their mortality. For any being, let's go more generally, for any being, for that being to be mortal would mean that their their being is subject to corruption. For a thing to be mortal, or to say that a thing is mortal, is to say that its being is subject to corruption. It can be, it can be dissolved or decomposed. Decomposed meaning taken apart. 
You can, you can reduce it to, to more simple parts. It, it can be corrupted and dissolved. If this is what it means to be mortal, that your being is subject to corruptibility, divisibility, decomposition, and so on and so forth, then could we ever say that of God, who is simple and not composed of any parts? Um, if the simple God who is not composed of any parts were to be mortal, then it would mean that the simple and pure being of God can be dissolved and be corrupted, but that's not possible. Uh, so therefore, God has mort- uh, immortality, and God alone has immortality, because God's being alone is not subject to corruption. All things created can be uh, cor- corrupted or can be dissolved if God permits that. Their being is subject to corruption and dissolution, but God's being is not subject to corruption or dissolution. Therefore, he alone hath uh, immortality. But here, here are more reasons. Previous to this in the confession, we have said that God's subsistence is in and of himself. His being is in and of himself, so he He doesn't have derived being from something else. He simply is pure being. And if his being is in and of itself, then there's nothing that caused God to be and nothing that could cause God not to be. So if God's being is in and of himself, then his being cannot be subject to corruption. If God is pure being, if he is simple, then he cannot be reduced to simpler parts or decomposed. Therefore, he alone hath in his very being, it is of his very being, to be immortal. God has life in himself. His subsistence is in and of himself. Therefore, God has immortality in himself. So, think of it that way. God has life in himself. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, that the Father has life in himself and has given to me that I also may have, uh, may have life in myself. That's a uh, slight misquotation, but that's, that's what he says of the Father. God has life in himself. If God has life in himself, then <laughs> there's no death. His subsistence is in and of himself. There's no power greater than God that could corrupt or dissolve him, and he does not depend upon something else for his life. Therefore, God alone hath immortality. Understanding this, the way in which God alone has immortality, then we can proceed to understand the immortality that God has granted to the human soul and then to the resurrected body. So the soul that God has made for man is incorruptible in the sense that God has so made it that it it does not decompose, it does not age. Um, If someone says, oh, you're an old soul, I mean, we know what that means. But the fact is, souls are not uh, subject to an aging process. Uh, They don't, you don't look at a soul as though you could see it and say, ooh, that's a really wrinkly old soul. (laughs) They're all just souls. They, they, They are immortal. They don't die. Uh, And so God has granted immortality to the soul. God has made the soul to not be subject to dissolution because he preserves it. So the mortality that the soul has is not inherent to the soul itself by virtue of the soul itself. The, The immortality of the soul is because God has granted it and God preserves it. So we know, and we say truly, that we have immortal souls. Our children learn in the catechism, I have a soul that will not die. And that's true. It's right for them to to know that. Their soul just doesn't have life in itself and doesn't have immortality in itself. It has a granted and preserved immortality. It's a conferred immortality because we live and move and have our being from him and through him and to him. And God, who is immortal sustains and upholds the immortality that he has given to our souls. And the resurrection is glorious and victorious because what does it do? It overcomes this power. 
the power to divide the soul and the body, the power to reduce the body to corruption. Jesus, in his resurrection, not only does he have a human soul that is immortal, as, as all human souls are, but he has been resurrected with a glorious body that is immortal and incorruptible, undefiled. And so Jesus has introduced into uh, creation since the fall for the first time an incorruptible body, an immortal body for an immortal soul. And this body that Jesus has inaugurated, and he is the only resurrected man. Other people were resuscitated on the earth, but none were resurrected with, uh, with a body like Jesus. We are all waiting for that resurrection. That resurrected body, which, which will be like Jesus, uh, will not be subject to age and decay. It will not be subject to corruption and dissolution. But this immortality that the body will have, again, is granted by God and preserved by God. It is not inherent to the body itself in, by virtue of the body itself. You could say it's inherent to the body itself by virtue of God's granting and protecting but it's not inherent to the body by virtue of the body itself. And so we rightly rejoice that death has been swallowed up by death, that death has been overpowered by an indestructible life, the life of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and that the resurrection which we celebrate every Sunday is a commemoration of the overpowering of these, uh, of these laws of decay to which man was cursed because of sin. And it's a, a wonderful comfort to the Christian to know that our lives, body and soul, will not be extinguished because it is maintained by him whose life cannot be extinguished. I know that my eternal life will never end because it's held by the one whose life cannot ever end. Our immortality, uh, which I've been talking about as though we're writing about it here, our immortality is founded upon God's immortality because God's life lives forever because God has life in himself therefore he is able to preserve our life forever and ever and ever and so our immortality is just as guaranteed as God's it's merely a granted and conferred and pr pr uh, protected and preserved immortality now that gives us uh, a sure and certain hope and a joy, something to look forward to and long for, the, the reunion of the immortal soul with a now immortal body, that's, a, that's eternal life. That's everlasting life without being subject to corruption and decay and dissolution and division. None of those things will be able to harm us or hurt us. Not only would it be wrong for those things to happen to us because we would be innocent, but they could not happen to us because we are held by a greater power than those things, and they've already been overpowered. Now, they've been definitively overpowered, but not finally and fully overpowered because we don't yet have our bodies, do we? And so death has been defeated, but not yet uh, completely extinguished. That will happen when our Lord returns and raises all of our bodies from the dust. The seeds that have been sown will be will be raised and harvested incorruptible. So our confession says that God alone has immortality, which is not denying the immortality of the soul or the resurrected body. It is noticing and confessing that God alone has it because God alone has life in himself. And his being is not subject to corruption or dissolution, decomposition or division. The next thing that we find here in this quotation from 1 Timothy 6.16 is that God dwells in the light which no man can approach unto. And this is really a repetition of divine invisibility and incomprehensibility. Invisibility. I was looking at uh, <clears throat> commentaries and expositions that study 1 Timothy 6.16, since that's the verse being quoted, and they repeatedly interpret 1 Timothy 6.16 in terms of invisibility and incomprehensibility. Did I spell that right? <laughs> so many I's and L's, my eye can't keep track of them. 
things are known or things can be said to be known insofar as they are seen. You see something, you have a knowledge of it. That's not the only way to know things. Blind persons have knowledge. But it's a way of speaking that the more a thing is seen, the more it is known. And so therefore, the more light there is on a given thing, the more knowable it is. Um, if, if you're driving at night, one of the reasons we say, oh, I don't like driving at night is because it's more difficult to see. And the less you can see, the less you know, the more nervous you feel. There's a lack of information with darkness. During the day, with the brightness, there's more information. We know more, we feel more secure. So in general, more light means more knowledge. Less light means less knowledge. And so something can be said to be unknowable or incomprehensible in one of two ways. Either there's such a lack of light that it can't be seen and therefore it can't be known. That would be one way in which something is unknowable. It's, it's so dark, you just you can't see it. Or something could be said to be unknown, not because of a lack of light, but because of a superabundance of light. There's so much light that it's so bright that it overpowers your capacity to perceive it by virtue of its brightness. And by virtue of its brightness, you can't really know it or comprehend it because it's, it's just too much. Uh, if, ha, have you ever left the, opto- the ophthalmologist or optometrist with your eyes dilated and suddenly it's like you're a prisoner that's come out and you think, oh no, I can't see anything. It's just too bright. You can't see because of the brightness. The brightness is overpowering your eyes. And so that is the reason why so many commentators look at 1 Timothy 6.16 and they, they refer God's invisibility to his incomprehensibility. God dwells in that light unto which no man can approach or unto which no man can attain. His brightness is so great that the being of God is so beyond us that we cannot possibly comprehend it. He is unknowable, not for a lack of light, but because of a super abundance of light, which overpowers the one who would perceive it. We cannot comprehend God with the eye, and we cannot comprehend God with the mind. But as we've said before, so so we must say again, that to call God incomprehensible or to say that we cannot comprehend him, is not to say we know nothing of God or that we do not know him at all. It's simply saying that our capacity to know him is less than what he is. So therefore, he's not comprehended. But we can apprehend him or know him. Um, Words that are often used to express this are cognition and comprehension. We affirm the former, we affirm that we have cognition of God, but we deny the latter. We deny that we have comprehension of God. And we have cognition of God because we can perceive him by the brightness of his light, but we do not have comprehension of God because the light is too great for us. God's being is greater than our minds can comprehend, and yet we can know him truly, though we cannot know him fully. And this terminology or this language of not knowing God, God being incomprehensible beyond our comprehension, these are not in any way bad things. If, if, God, was, if God were comprehensible, he would be lesser than you. Do you is that what we want? Is that really God? Uh, it's, it's good that God cannot be comprehended with the eye or the mind. In <clears throat> this past summer, as most of you know, my family, we were able to go and visit the Mediterranean and see Rome and Greece and uh, Italy and Greece and and many different places. It was a wonderful, wonderful trip. And one of the things that I found interesting as a Christian was to get a better understanding of what idolatry looked like uh, from the age of the church. And, you know, what kind of idols were in temples? What kinds of things were they bowing to and making offerings to? And of course, we've seen many pictures of idols in different cultures, but particularly, what was first century Mediterranean idolatry like? Um, Or even older than that, uh, during the time of of the kingdoms of Israel. And (laughs) just as the scriptures say, I mean, they're basically just statues, often weird statues 
uh, of part animal, part man, or exaggerated uh, features of, of uh, certain physical parts of, of a man or a woman deity, but they're ultimately, it's, it's a statue. Maybe it's a really big statue. Maybe it has gold and paint. Maybe it's a flashy, nice-to-see statue or something. But at the end of the day, it's just a statue. And it would be in the temple, you know, in the, the deepest part of the temple, and you would go in, but you could walk around that statue. You could, you could in a glance, comprehend it. In, in, in 10 seconds or less, you can have a full comprehension of that so-called deity because that's all it is, is that statue. Your eye has just comprehended. I have a 360 view of it. Uh, I see the name plaque. That's all that it is. You have comprehended that deity, and yet people are willing to give their religious obedience and sacrifices to that statue that they can comprehend in a moment. In fact, that God is so comprehensible, they have multiple other ones, (laughs) and they can comprehend them all. So when we confess that our God is incomprehensible, it's, it's, it's exclaiming, it's pronouncing his majesty, his greatness, his being beyond us in a way that we ought to be praising him to say, I, I'm glad that I cannot comprehend you or you would be less than me. And I repent of the ways in which I worship and serve things that are lesser than me and infinitely lesser than you, God. If we could comprehend God with the eye, or comprehend him in the mind, he would be less than us, but God is infinitely greater than us. He dwells in that light unto which no man can attain, and therefore he is not just invisible with the eye, but incomprehensible to the mind, and we praise him for this. Now, combine these two things. Uh, Man's immortality, our, our granted immortality, God has immortality by nature, we have it by grace. Compare our immortality with God's incomprehensibility. Or not compare, but, but bring them together. If we were given immortality, and we have been, and God were comprehensible, then what would eternal life end up being at some point? At some point, you would come to a comprehension of God. If God were comprehensible and you had an eternity to comprehend him, at some point you would. And so it's a further blessing to know that the eternal life that we have been given is combined with an incomprehensible God who will always exceed us, and so we will always be in awe of him and worshiping him and serving him forever and ever. We'll never come to the point where we say, yeah, I've I've mastered this, what's next? If you think of the most advanced studies that we can generally do here, you know, if you If you get the highest academic degree, you spend a lot of effort trying to master something. And even then, after you get that highest academic degree, you still continue to learn. And there are people who are true masters of their field of research or their field of practice. Uh, You could have a master carpenter. You could have a master welder. Or you have a master teacher of some such subject. Um, You could have a a master seamstress, a master cook. You know, all, all the different disciplines of knowledge and practical disciplines that we have as men and women, all of them can be mastered. And it's it's enjoyable to have a proficiency in knowledge and in, in practice for a given thing. But you also can get tired of that thing and want other things at the same time or, or whatever. And that's fine. We have hobbies. We have interests. We move on because there's more to know and, and so on and so forth. If God were comprehensible and we were immortal and we are immortal because of grace, then eternal life would eventually come to that question of, now what? What next? And praise God, that will never happen because God's, God will always be incomprehensible to us. Will we be able to grow in our knowledge and experience of God? Yes, as we are perfected and made more able to enjoy him, true. But God's infinity, his greatness, his majesty will always exceed whatever, uh, great not greatness, but whatever... Uh, maturity that we attain to in, in, that, in life forever and ever. That's a, a comfort to know that the light will always overpower us and we can always bask in it. And eternal life is an eternal drawing near to an infinite God, which is an everlasting delight. 
And so our cognition will increase in quality and quantity. It will be a better knowledge and more knowledge. But it will never attain to comprehension of God. Even that, that beatific vision to, to know God with the eye of the resurrected body and to know God with the perfected soul, that, that knowledge of God, that visibility of God will be so beautiful and wondrous it will satisfy us forever and ever and ever. And yet God is so great that we will still not have comprehended uh, his infinite majesty. So here in, in our Confession of Faith, I'm glad that they brought in this, this portion from 1 Timothy 6.16 that was originally in the first London Confession of Faith. Uh, God alone hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. God has immortality because he has life in himself. We have immortality because he has given us life in the soul and life in the resurrected body, and he preserves it, and it's guaranteed by his power and his immortality. And he dwells in that light unto which no man can approach, and yet that doesn't mean stay away, nor does that mean we know nothing. It doesn't leave us in darkness. It's all actually telling us that we are overpowered by the light. And that is not something that scares us. It's something that attracts us. It's not something that makes us disappointed. It's something that satisfies us forever and ever and ever. As Paul goes on to say, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So thank you for your attention. That's a short lesson today uh, from our Confession of Faith, and I hope that you've enjoyed it. Thank you.